Well, this morning we are wrapping up a quarter of a year in the book of Romans. And if you come from a church that spends like, you know, four years on one verse of the Bible, that may not seem like a big deal, but at Shoreline, we've been in the book of Romans for three months. It's been a great study, and we're in chapter 16. And if you open your Bibles to chapter 16 of Romans, if you open your iPad or your phone to your Bible app, and you go to Romans chapter 16, you find one of those chapters that sometimes people just skip right over. Why? Because it's a list of names. Say hi to so-and-so. Say hello to so-and-so. This person's got a church home. Tell, tell everybody there hello. It's, you're getting to the end of Romans, and the Apostle Paul is, is walking through all of these greetings. As a matter of fact, starting in verse 3, it's greet Priscilla and Aquila, then you got greet the church, then you got greet these friends, then greet Mary, then it just goes on and on, greeting, greeting, greeting. And sometimes, even if we love the Bible and we read it closely, we get to a chapter like this and we can kind of just skim right along. I want to encourage you and let you know, don't ever do that. Because within these, and, and each of these people matter to Jesus, each of these people are part of the church in that history and time, but also within this, there's a little portion uh, that we're going to look at closely today and, and kind of finish up what we've been doing these last 12 weeks, and that is looking at this great book of the Bible. Romans it really breaks into two parts, chapters 1 through 11, and you can summarize chapters 1 through 11 with these two words, I believe. The Apostle Paul says, this is what we believe. I believe this. I believe it with all my heart. Then you can summarize chapters 12 through 16 with these words, I will, I will live a certain way. Because I believe this, I will live this way. Because I believe this with all my heart, I will not do certain things. Our beliefs impact how we live, listen closely, if we really believe them. If we really believe what we say we believe, it transforms how we live our lives. And so in this final chapter of Romans, and the part we're going to look at, Here's the I will. Get ready for this. I will beware. Be careful. Watch out. There's certain things we should be careful of, beware of, watch out for. And the Apostle Paul is warning us, the Spirit of God through the Apostle Paul to, for the church of all times is saying there's certain things you should beware of, be careful of. Now we've all seen warning signs. You know, sign, sign, there's signs posted in different places warning us about things. If you go online and you pull up, you know, serious warning signs or funny warning signs, you can see all kinds of pictures of warning signs in different places. So I want to paint the picture for you of some different signs that are actually posted in different places. Here's one. It's, it's along the ocean side, and the, and the sign says, shark sighted today. And then it says, enter water at your own risk. And behind the sign, you can see the coastal line and then the water filled with people frolicking around in the shark-infested waters. So some people aren't taking the sign very seriously. Here's another sign. Here's the warning. It, it asks the question, is there life after death? And then it says, trespass here and find out. <laughs> kind of a serious warning, right? Here's, here's a, a sign that's in a workplace where there's lots of heav heavy physical labor and lifting going on. And the sign simply says this, lift with your knees, not with your back. And then the smaller print, it says, your knees are loving and kind. Your back is spiteful and full of hate. <laughs> Anybody hear of back problems? You know what it's talking about, right? It's like, oh, don't, you know, watch out for your back. Here's another one. This is actually on a mountain road. I don't know if this is real or not, but I thought it was kind of interesting. It, it's a, a picture of a mountain road where there's a gap, about a 30-foot gap in the road where the road is broken away, and there's a giant hole. And underneath it, it says, just speed up a bit. You got this. <laughs> I don't know if that's good advice or not. Here's another driving one. Speed limit 35. Unless, of course, Mr. Important is running late. So you have to decide if you're Mr. Important or Mrs. Important. Uh, here, here's, here's what I found very interesting. This sign says, touching wires causes instant death. $200 fine. Does that seem a little excessive? You're dead and you still get a bill, right? And then the last one, and this is what I thought of my wife, because my wife, when she hears about an accident or something happening, she'll say, to, if somebody dies in some terrible way, she'll say, well, they probably went into shock and didn't feel anything, right? She wants to just feel comforted that they went into shock. But this sign says this. It says, the sign says, danger, do not touch. Not only will this kill you, it will hurt the whole time you're dying. <laughs> so signs, warnings. So here's the question. Why do people give warnings? Why do people give warnings? Why do people give bewares? Why do people post signs? I want to suggest three reasons, and these will probably make sense to you when you think about it. When you think, what are three, here's three reasons that people will post a sign or give a warning. Number one, because we love somebody. 
We give a warning at times because we love somebody. If you're a parent or a grandparent, you know what I'm talking about. Parents and grandparents are big on giving warnings. Be careful of this. Watch out for that. Why? Because they want to ruin their kids or grandkids' fun? No, because they love them. And here's another reason people post signs. Because we see something we think others don't see. We give warnings to people because we see something we think they don't see. We can see down the road. We know what's coming. And here's the third reason people warn others. Because we know where they will end up if they don't get a warning. We've walked part of life, and we know if you keep going down that road, if you keep doing that, behaving that way, talking that way, we know where that's going to take you. We know where you're going to end up if you keep going down that road. And so we give a warning saying, we know where this is going to take you, and we love you so much. Go back to number one. Because we love you, we post a warning. So I want to suggest, if we ask this question, why does God warn us? You know, in the Bible, there's different warnings. We're going to look at a series of warnings in Romans chapter 16. Why does God warn us of certain things? To ruin our fun? To mess with our lives? No. I want to suggest that God gives warnings for the exact same reasons. Because he loves us. God loves you. He does not want you to hurt yourself or hurt somebody else. So God gives warnings. He gives bewares for us. Why does God give warnings? Because he sees things that he knows we don't see. God doesn't just see down the road and around the corner. God sees down the road and around 57 infinite corners. Of just God knows what's ahead. So when he gives a warning, he knows where we're heading. He knows the consequences. And so he gives a warning. Why does God warn us? Because he knows where we'll end up if we keep going the direction we're going. So God in his love, God in his wisdom, God in his care, actually in the Bible gives us warnings. And if you find yourself like those people with that sign that says shark sighted today and you decide to swim in the water, when God gives warnings, don't look and say, he's trying to wreck my beach day. I say, God's trying to mess with my life. No, when, when God gives a warning, say, he loves me. He's smarter than I am. And God knows where this will take me. So we hear God's warnings. So when you open up Romans, and as we continue this, uh, as we uh, con conclude this series on Romans, we get to the 16th chapter, and it seems almost out of place. I mean, here Paul is, and he's saying, greet this person and greet this church and tell these folks I said hello. And, oh, this person, that was the first Christian convert, convert in all of Asia. You know, tell them I said hello. And there's all these very personal greetings. It just goes on and on and on. And like I said, sometimes we just skip those parts. But if you skip it, you miss that right in the middle, verses 17 to 19, just these couple of verses, three verses, are at least six distinct warning signs being posted for us, posted for you, and particularly posted for the church, for God's people. These warnings are given to Christians to know how to live together in a way that honors God and creates community. So let's walk together and look at these, at these six different I will bewares, these things that God says be careful of. So here's number one. I will beware of people who cause division in the church. We're warned. Be careful of those people who are dividers. Look at me at Romans 16, 17. I urge you, that urging is, he's like, take this seriously. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way. Watch out for those who cause divisions. Be careful of those people who are always being divisive. I make sure once a year I preach a sermon that hits the topic of be careful of people in the church who are whiners, complainers, negative, always, always just against everything. Grumblers, the Bible calls them. Do you know that grumbling and whining is actually a sin? Some people think it's just a recreational activity for people who don't have a lot to do, right? Well, I, I, I'm really good at it. I can find what's wrong and grumble and complain. And every year I make sure I touch on this topic because the Bible deals with grumbling and complaining as one of the worst sins that people can commit because it rips churches apart. It rips families apart. It rips workplaces apart. That negative, critical spirit. Now, that's not saying there aren't real problems that we should deal with. We need to. But you talk to the right person at the right time in the right spirit. You deal with tough things. But some of you guys, it's the spirit of complaining and negativity is a poison. So, so Paul warns us, I urge you, brothers and sisters, watch out, beware, watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way. So here's a question for you. Ask this question of yourself. Do I recognize those who cause division? Do I recognize those people who cause division? And let me tell you something. 
Ask yourself that question and say, do I recognize people who create division and cause division even when it's me? For all six of these warnings, don't just look at other people, but pause and say, could it be that I'm... Because here's the thing. If, if we're getting a warning in churches, there's some people who divide and some people who, are, who, who teach falsely and stuff. Someone's doing it, right? So, so here's what I've done as I prepared this sermon is I've looked at each of these things and said, Lord, how do we beware of these things in your church? But how do I beware that I'm not the one causing these things? How do I check my own heart? We all have to be humble enough to say, if I'm not careful, I can be the one who's creating the problem. So how, how do I recognize those who cause division? Let me give you a few things to help you recognize to see if it's you or someone around you. Divisive people always recognize something wrong. They can see it all the time in every single person, in every situation. They have this, they, they think it's a spiritual gift, <laughs> but it's probably not from heaven. It could be from the pit of hell. But they, there are some people that, that they can just see what's wrong with every person, every situation, every ministry, every song, every instrument, every pastor, every sermon. They just have this ability to see what's wrong in everything. Now, let me ask you something. Is there something wrong in every single human being if you look close enough? What's the answer? Yes. I mean, every human, if, even, even if we're saved by Christ's grace, we're being sanctified, we're becoming like him, but we're not perfected yet. So if you are around somebody who just, just they just always see the negative and what's wrong. It's not those things aren't real, but is that what you want to be or the focal point of your life? And people like that become very divisive because they're always pointing out what's wrong with everything. Also, people who are divisive, how do you know if you're dealing with that? How do you know if that's happening in you? These are people that seem to have this ability to pit people against each other. Well, did you know that so-and-so said that? Well, did you know that? Did you know? And all of a sudden, they, they, they get people sideways with each other and kind of bugged at each other, and then they just step back. They just kind of watch as tension and division happens. There's people like that. Paul says, beware of divisive people. Watch out. People like this just can't shut their mouth. They always have something to say, something to tweet, something to email, something to bring up about something. It's just, they just cannot control their mouths. This is one of my challenges as a, as a, as a Christian, because before I was a Christian, I just, I talk too much sometimes. I've had to learn how to try to control my mouth. You say, so it's a good thing you can make your living talking. You're a pastor. Yeah, but there's times where I'm just going to go, edit, edit, edit. And you know what I'm talking about? But if, you, if people don't edit, their mouths just keep going. Be careful if you cannot control what you say. I, I remember uh, early on in my ministry, I've, I've been a pastor uh, since I was a fairly young man, and I've only had really two ministry assistants. I had Debbie Rose at our church in, uh, in Byron Center, Michigan for 14 years. She was my ministry assistant. And then Ramel Retzlaff, who's my ministry assistant now for 11 years, and I pray and hope she'll be my ministry assistant as long as I'm, I don't feel like I'm called any other church, so as long as I'm here serving, I pray that we get to work together. But I haven't gone through lots of ministry assistants, but these are people who have confidentiality. They have to be positive in what they say. They have to be gracious with people. But when I first became a pastor, my first pastoral role, I was called the interim pastor. This, I, I, was, I was working at this church in, in, down in Southern California from my last year of college through seminary and my first few years as an ordination as a pastor. So one senior pastor retired, another senior pastor retired, and I was the only one still there. So what, what, when they call you an interim pastor, that means you can do all the work of the lead pastor, but you can get paid like an intern. Everybody follow that? So I became the interim pastor. And uh, so I inherited this ministry assistant who was the, the lead pastor, kind of church's ministry assistant. But here's the problem. Her mouth was like poison, and she was always negative. I remember hearing her answer the phone one time, and the person on the other end had, had asked, is the lead pa I, wasn't, I wasn't the lead pastor. I wasn't the youth leader, but I, somebody said, is the lead pastor there? I knew that because she responded by, with his name. She said, oh, so-and-so, pastor so-and-so is not here today. Yeah, he said he was going to go visit some sick people in their homes, but I know sick people, and he never visits them, so I don't know where he really is. Yeah, yeah, woe is right, right? That was my inheritance. This is the person who became my ministry assistant, right? So within the first week or two of me working with this person, she, that was continuing on, divisive, poisonous stuff. I, I met with her with the vice president of the church board. Never meet with a divisive person alone because it's your word against them. I met with the vice president of our church board. And we sat down and said, you're doing these things. You're talking this way. Your tone is terrible. Your words are negative. You're dishonest. You're, you're undercutting people. And so we confronted her. And within about a week or two, people were calling me saying, how could you attack her? You or she was telling people I had attacked her and I was mean to her. So we fired her. 
We meaning me and the vice president of the board. Did I mention she was a founding member of the church? Um, but after she was fired, I started getting flooded by calls and comments from people saying, thank you so much. She's been like that for years. But everyone just looked the other way. Oh, that's just how so-and-so is. That's just how he talks. That's how she is. No! Beware of the divisive person who's pitting people against people. Right here in this list, and I think, that, I think that this Holy Spirit inspired this right here because Paul's going through all these people that he loves. And as you think about people he love, you want to say, but be careful for this or for this. Watch out for this. And that's what the Apostle Paul is doing. He's warning us. I will be aware of the device of people. And then number two, I will be aware of those who, twi- who twist the clear teaching of the Bible. I'll be aware of those people who take God's word, his spirit-inspired, true, given word, and take things that they don't like or that aren't fitting the way they live their lives and just twist it and manipulate the Bible to fit what they want it to say. And so he says, beware of those. Look, look with me again at verse 17, Romans 16. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Paul says, you have learned God's word. Paul is teaching the scriptures. He's teaching God's truth. But there's people that are taking it and they're manipulating it. They're twisting it to their own devices. So here's a question for you. Ask yourself, do I know what the Bible teaches and recognize when it is being twisted? Do I know the Bible well enough? Here, do I know the Bible so well that if somebody misquotes it or misuses it, I recognize that? This is one of the reasons why every one of your pastors here at Shoreline, we encourage you to open this book and read it every day of your life. This is why we make a reading guide that we put on our website and we make available to you every single week, year round. It's not just to fill time or fill somewhere on the website. We want you to open this book and prepare for next Sunday's sermon. This is why we challenge you to open God's word and read it so that you know it so well that when somebody says, oh, that's not really what the Bible says, or oh, they start teaching something that's false, you go, bingo, ding, that's wrong. We should recognize it. I was so proud as a pastor years ago, our church in Michigan, I'd been there for a number of years pastoring, and... Every year, there was a bunch of families that went to a church camp. There was a church campground nearby where our church was, and a bunch of families would go, and, and they would go for the, a long weekend, and they'd hang out as families, and then they'd do some, but they had a chapel there, and they had a guest preacher every week preach a sermon. So this particular Sunday, they brought in a guest preacher who never preached there before, and this person was teaching false things, was twisting the scriptures. And the person who, the person who ran the camp didn't think that way, but they brought this, this person was gregarious, warm, charismatic, you know, not, not in the sense of like you know, uh, praise the Lord, but like great engaging and just, you know, just really dynamic communicators. So there they sat and they heard the sermon, but a bunch of the families in the church I pastored were going, ding, ding, ding. This is wrong. This is unbiblical. This guy might be dynamic and funny and interesting, but what he's preaching isn't biblical. I got flooded by phone calls that afternoon by families leaving church calling me saying, Pastor Kevin, this guy that they had preaching up here doesn't believe the Bible and he questions these things. And, and he was subtle, but they, they got it. Why? Because they knew the Bible. Would you recognize if somebody's teaching falsely? Would you go, ding, 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 that's wrong. Let me look here in Ephesians 2 or in, in the book of Revelation or in Genesis 3. I know what the word of God says. I see Doug sitting here. Doug, you've been, you've been, how many years have you been working with our fourth and fifth graders teaching them to memorize the Bible? How many years here at Shoreline? 20 years. Thank you. And even this morning, you were over there with fourth and fifth graders, right? Yeah. Uh, teaching young people the word of God. Well, gosh, if we teach them the Bible, they're going to start thinking that way. Yes! <laughs> That's the whole idea. And, and, and so, uh, you know, we, we need to be able to recognize when somebody's teaching false. So all these people are calling me from the church, and they're saying, Pastor Kevin, you got to call the director of the camp and say, where'd they find this guy? And he can't come back and preach there again. He's not teaching the word of God. He's twisting it. So, when I, cont- so I contacted the, the director of the camp. He said, yeah, that's the first time this guy's been here. And, and I said, well, I've been getting calls. And I said, I said, yeah, it seems like he's off. I said, yeah, it sounds like he's off. And he said, well, we can never have him here preaching again. That's right. This is a Christian camp. And so, but but do you, would you recognize that if somebody was teaching falsely? Uh, there's two words that I've, I've, I've taught you in the past, but there are two theological words called exegesis and eisegesis. These are theological words. Exegesis means, we get the word exit from that, uh, from the root word. Exegesis means we let the truth exit, come out of the scriptures and teach us what's true. I said, Jesus, is I take what I want and I go read it into the Bible and I force it on the Bible and I make the Bible say what I want. That's just wrong. So when my life doesn't line up with what the Bible says, I rearrange my life and my thinking. I don't try to rearrange the Bible. And so, so Paul says, be careful of those people who twist, who manipulate God's word. 
Do we know his word? Do we hold to it? Are we confident in it? This is why if someone wants to join Shoreline Church, we have a statement of beliefs, core doctrines, core beliefs. You cannot join and become a member of Shoreline Church unless you agree with certain things because they're the core things the Bible teaches. And then if somebody says, okay, I'm a member of Shoreline, now I'd like to teach third graders or I'd like to do something with, volunteer with youth. If you're gonna be influenced with other people believe in our church, we have another statement of beliefs you have to read and adhere to. Why? Because what we believe matters. I believe, therefore I will. I once had somebody say, well, you know, I, I don't necessarily want to, you know, like line up with all the beliefs, but I just want to work with kids. I mean, that is, you know, does, do you have to do that with if you're just working with kids? I'm thinking, especially kids, <laughs> right? I mean, you got to teach kids truth from the time they're young. They're impressionable. But surely we care, we care about what I believe because it impacts what I will do. And we hold to what God's word says. And so Paul continues on to a third warning. And they kind of come rapid fire, boom, boom, boom. So here's warning number three. I will beware of getting too close to people in the church who are troublemakers. I'll be aware of divisiveness. I'll be aware of false teaching. But I'll be aware of getting too cozy with people that are doing those sorts of things. So continue on in that passage. We'll read it one more time. Romans 16, 17. I urge you, brothers and sisters, to watch out for those who cause divisions and put obstacles in your way that are contrary to the teaching you have learned. Keep away from them. Paul says, keep away from them. Be careful of them. Well, what if that person is me? Well, I, how do I keep away from me? No, I don't keep away from me. I come humbly before God and say, God, I become divisive. God, I, I, I've twisted your word to reflect what I want it to say, but not really what it says. And we let the spirit of God deal with us. But there is a warning here. Sometimes in the church, what happens is people look the other way. Well, that's just what she's like. She's always doing that, you know, and it's no big deal. Oh, that's just, just how he is. And, and the warning here is not to, to stay away from people in the world that aren't Christians that are doing things wrong. It's saying be careful in the church of cozying up with and treating as normal that which God says shouldn't be happening. Do we love each other enough to say, you know, I, I got to tell you, I disagree with you on that. But I think God's word says something different. Or do we say, you know what? What you're doing right now is really divisive. Most of you are like, I could never do that. Well, Paul's not saying to necessarily confront them, but he says, don't become too close with those people that are dividers, that are false teachers, that are manipulative. Be careful of those people. They should, they should feel a sense of people being cautious of them because they are in a place where they're bringing danger to the church. So don't get too close to people who are troublemakers. So here's the question. What does a troublemaker look like? What do those people look like who, who are always creating problems? And they're, they're, they're always noticing something's, something's wrong, not legitimately wrong, but just they're nitpicking things. The first church I served as a pastor, uh, before, I came, before I came, there was this family that was a long-term family in the church, very active in many different ways, but, th but they just were really kind of power-hungry and very manipulative and very negative in a lot of ways. And the husband and wife of this family had tried to drive out the previous two pastors, had tried to get the previous two pastors fired because these pastors wouldn't do what this couple said they should do. And they were really upset because they were never, never elected to be on any board or place of real influence because they were actually doing lots of negative things and people were cautious of them, as they should have been. So when I became, when I stepped into becoming the interim pastor, where I was the, the, at that point I was the only pastor at this church, within a day or two, the husband of this couple shows up at my office, knocks on the door. Hey, pastor, how you doing? I want to talk with you a little bit. And I said, okay, come on in. And I'm already kind of like a little, you know, some people are just kind of cautious, right? And so he sits down and he goes, hey, pastor, man, me and you, you and me, we are going to get this church going the right direction. We are going to, I got some ideas for you. And he starts laying down, this is what you should do. And, and we're going to do this. And we're going to do this. And he kind of, I listened to kind of his whole speech, his whole sales speech. And he kind of finished. And I was a young pastor, but I said, you know, I said, I got to tell you, there's no you and me. There's the church. And we have a board. We have a leadership team. And they lead the church. So this is not a thing right here. So within a week or two, he was trying to get me fired. See, these people, it's the same pattern again and again and again. This is the couple that wrote a six-page letter and signed it, tearing me apart and tearing my wife and family apart, who accused my wife of getting up and walking out of church every Sunday and disrupting the service. When what she was doing was, after the singing time, she was taking all the children and all the toddlers to children's church and teaching them and missing out on worship she would have loved to have been part of, but she was serving the children. And in this letter, he said, and then, and then his wife just gets up and walks out and just disrupts the service every Sunday. Right? I got that letter. I took it to my church board. And here's what I said. I, I was young. 
I'll give you a, a, a gentle version. I was pretty upset. And I said, you discipline these people or I will. And if I do, it won't be pretty. You know what our board did? They sat down with this couple and they said, you may not come to the communion table. You may not break the bread of, with us or drink the cup with us. And don't you ever talk to our pastor again. You don't got a problem, you talk to us. Someone say praise God for leaders who have got the guts to do what leaders are supposed to do, right? And this family kind of fell into line a little bit more because somebody actually confronted them. And they never talked to me again and that was okay. Um, because they said, if you can't be kind or gracious, and they knew they couldn't be that. So, so but that... Be careful. Are you cozying up to people who are damaging the Christ church? Be careful. Beware. It's dangerous. And Paul continues on. I will beware of those who feed their own appetites rather than serve Jesus. People that are all about me, 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 gimme, 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 more, more, more. The church is all about satisfying my needs. And if Shoreline won't do it, I'll go down the road to another church because I want what I want. Or do I come to serve Jesus? Look at what Paul says in verse 18. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. You get the picture? There's two ways you come at being part of the church. You come to glorify God and lift him up and serve Jesus, or you come to say, me, 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 me. And he's saying, be careful of that attitude. Now, I'm, I'm not saying when you come to church, you should say, well, I don't want to receive anything and I don't want to grow. Of course you want to grow. Of course you want to receive. Of course you want your kids to be encouraged. But the main focus is to glorify our Lord, the Messiah, the Christ. Amen? I mean, that's why we gather. We gather for the glory of Jesus. So here's the question. What does self-centered Christianity look like? What does it look like when we're being driven by what I get rather than what I give to Jesus? And you can, you can picture it in your own mind, but it can happen in lots of different areas. It's the singer who shows up at a church, and I had this happen one time, starts singing on the worship team, and then says to the worship leader, you know, I'm not getting enough face time and enough solo time. I need more time up front and I need more solo time. What? <laughs> At what point did worship in the church become about you and your solo time and not about glorifying Jesus? When I heard that, I said to our worship leader, I said, I said listen, two months off for that person. They, they're not on stage. They didn't do anything. They left the church because they weren't getting what they wanted. Beautiful voice, but a toxic heart. It's the pastor who needs the best parking spot and all the praise and it's, it's the pastor who, needs, who makes it all about me instead of pointing to Jesus. I check my heart on that again and again and again. Sure, and I were talking yesterday, just different pastors, public pastors who are falling and crashing. And, and if it's become all about them, then when they fall, everyone falls because it's been about them. When you, when you recognize that I'm a, a frail, broken human being, which if you know me at all, you know it's true, you don't build your faith on me. I, lo I love the great old hymn, On Christ the Solid Rock I Stand. All other, sand, all other ground is shifting sand. We base our faith on Jesus. Amen? So if you get close enough to me and you recognize I'm an imperfect human being, and for the record, I am to the cars, I am online, I am in the courtyard, I am. I'm trying to, I'm trying to be sanctified and be more like Jesus every day. And I fall on my face about every day too. If you're not sure, talk to people close. Talk to my wife and she'll tell you, I love him, but you know what? He's not perfect. But, but, but when, when a church is built around a pastor, it, it's, it's when a person comes to a church and their primary thing is business networking. And they're going around handing out flyers and things every Sunday in the courtyard. And we have every so often somebody shows up at Shoreline. They're like, you know, I'd like to come and uh, promote my thing. And we say, that's not, that's not what we're here for. We're here to worship. Now, if you can build relationships over time, that's fine. But, but we're here to worship Jesus. Amen. So be careful, beware of those who, whose focus, and I love how Paul says it, they're not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. And if you're becoming like that, if you're becoming it's all about me and me getting what I want, bring that before Jesus. Because it doesn't honor him. Say, I want to be all about Jesus. And then we continue on. The Apostle Paul, the fifth warning he gives. I will beware of people in the church whose words are deceptive and falsely flattering. I'll beware of those whose words are deceptive and falsely flattering. Look again at verse 18. For such people are not serving our Lord Christ, but their own appetites. By smooth talk and flattery, they deceive the minds of naive people. Oh, you're wonderful. You're the best. You're incredible. I had a couple people after the service this morning just lavish that praise on me joking around about this part of the sermon. They say, oh, pastor, that's the best sermon I've ever heard. Oh, pastor, you're amazing. Pastor, you look great. I'm like, knock it off. Uh, but they were, they were teasing, obviously. They were having fun. But, but there's this warning by smooth talk and flattery. 
Here's the question. Are my ears tuned in to false speech? When there's false flattery and speech, are my ears tuned in? Do I pick it up? I listen for this. I listen for this when somebody new comes to the church and starts talking to me right away. And if they say, if they say oh, pastor, pastor, this church is amazing. It's just, just what I've been looking for. It's exactly what I need. And your sermons, I mean, they're just inspired. They're, they're incredible. They're amazing. The music was just heavenly and incredible. Now, the last church I went to, oh, my God, the pastor was terrible. He was horrible. And the music, oh, that, they just went on. And, and they, I, I'll, I'll just go, time out. Hold on, time out. I had that happen one time where a couple came to our church in Michigan. And they came up to me the first time I'd met them. They'd been coming a couple weeks. I'd kind of recognized them, but I hadn't got a chance to say hi yet. They, came up, they just started praising me and praising the church. And, and, and then they started, and they said, oh, in our church that we came from, you know, and they just started kind of, and I, I could just feel it. Here it comes. Here's that negative thing. They're praising, false flattery with me. Just too much, right? Too much. But they start putting us wrong in this other church. And I said, oh, well, what church, what church did you come from? And they told me the name of the church. And what they didn't know is that the senior pastor of that church was one of my closest ministry friends. They didn't know that he had shared with me that there was a group in that church they were, they were all upset. They were, they were attacking the church and bad-mouthing. They, they called themselves the concerned members of, put church name here, right? We're the concerned. They had a formal, they had meetings. They kept minutes against the pastor and against the church. And then, and then they were all giving one penny a week in their offering envelopes to make a point. So I knew all this. So when they told me they were from that church, I went, ding, ding, ding. I know I, they're part of this group. And here's what else I knew. I knew that in a short time, they would dislike me as much as they disliked their pastor at that church. Because I knew this pastor is a great godly man, great church, great preacher. I was doing my doctoral work with him and just a, one of the best preachers I've ever heard. And, they, and, and when, they, when they started talking negatively about the church, and when I realized what it was, I said, yeah, time out, time out. We don't do that. I said, we don't do that here. We're not, we're not going down there. If you have a th- problem with your previous church, go talk with your pastor. If you're going to be here, don't talk to me or other people and don't poison other churches. You say, man, I, I couldn't do that. Well, my temperament sets that I kind of, I can do that comfortably, but man, we all need to just take that step back. We're being warned here to watch out for those behaviors and practices that are damaged in the church. So beware when somebody is falsely flattering, when they're overdoing it. And then the Apostle Paul gets to a final warning, a sixth warning. I will beware of evil and seek that which is good. I'll, be, I'll recognize that evil is real, and when I see it going on, I'm going to beware of it and fight against it, and I'm going to seek that which is good. Look at verse 19 of Romans 16. Everyone has heard about your obedience, so I rejoice because of you. He's talking to the Roman church. I rejoice because of you, but I want you to be wise about what is good and innocent about what is evil. When he says innocent about evil, he says don't, it's not that you don't recognize it, but innocent about evil is that you're not engaging in it. To recognize where something's going on that is not of divine, godly origin, but is of some person's sinful, personal thing or maybe actually demonic and hellish. And there's, some things that, there's things that come against the church that are right from the pit of hell. And this is one of the reasons why I think every pastor should actually have two or three people around. There's, this, there's a spiritual gift called discernment of spirits. And if you read through the Bible, you see that one of the spiritual gifts is discernment of spirits. A person with a gift of discernment of spirits can can be in a situation and see a person or something happening, and they know on a spiritual level that's from God, that's from human origin, or that's demonic and from the pit of hell. And by God's grace, I married a woman who has that spiritual gift. And Sherry has developed that gift through the years. Early on in our marriage, Sherry would say, you know, Kevin, be careful about this person. I'm a little concerned. And And I would just kind of like, oh, yeah, whatever, you know until I realized this is a spiritual gift she has. And, and I had times where it took a month, six months, eight months until it came to the surface that there were things going on with this person that Sherry knew the moment she met them. Now, don't run away from my wife. Don't worry, she's not gonna report on you or anything. She's not like that. But, 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 I, but, but I've learned through the years to trust my wife because God's gifted her in a way that she knows. And so if there's something that's of an evil origin, to be careful of that, to watch out for that. Do you know what's coming from God? Do you know what's coming from people's hearts? And, and, I, and then do you know what's actually not from God at all, but from the enemy? And the antidote, the antidote to this is really what Paul says, seeking that which is good. Recognize evil, fight against it, but seek that which is good. Consume yourself with seeking what is good. Consume yourself with doing what is good. Consume yourself with following the God who is good. And as you do that, then recognize when something is evil and stand against it. Too often in the church, we're just quiet. When things that are happening, they're divisive and damaging. And and so we need to be humble. We need to search our own hearts. And when we see a pattern going on in somebody else's life, we need to love them enough to say, you know what? 
If we're friends, if we're both Christians, I got to tell you right now what you're doing is divisive. I got to tell you what you're doing right now. That's gossip. I got to tell you what you're doing right now is twisting scripture because you're not living the way it should or your family member's not living the way you should, so you're changing God's word to fit what you like but not what it says. Can we dare to, to take that challenge? See, if you skip over Romans 16 because there's a bunch of names, you miss all this stuff. And so, so we're going to pray. Here's the question. Or last thought, a, there's a clear and strong beware and warning that's a gift. And each of these warnings in Romans 16 and anywhere in the Bible, anytime that God gives you a warning, anytime that God gives you a beware, don't be like the people that says, shark sighted today, I'm going for a swim. When God gives you a warning, he does it because he loves you. He does it because he's wiser than we are. And he does it because he knows where we'll end up if we don't hear the warning and heed the warning. Lord Jesus, this is our prayer today. That every single one of us would humble our hearts. Before we point at someone else, we would pause and say, Lord, do I have a tendency to divide? Lord, do I, do I ever take your word and twist it to fit what I like or what I want or what's culturally normative rather than following what your word says? Lord, may we search our own hearts and recognize where, where there's anything happening in our lives that doesn't line up with what you want. And Lord, we thank you for the book of Romans, this, this clear declaration of what we believe and how we are to live. Our prayer as we finish this series is that this, that this 12 weeks together will have tuned our hearts and our minds into who you are and what you teach and our lives to becoming more and more like Jesus. That our I believe will lead us to an I will that makes us more and more like Jesus for his glory and for his sake. And Lord, when you give us warnings, let us not run the other way or ignore it. Let us humble our hearts and understand that in love, you warn the children you care about. Thank you, God, for loving us enough to give us these warnings. Help us live into them in growing measure with passing days, we pray in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Hey, if you're online, I want to give you a special uh, invitation, uh, also in the courtyard and also in the parking lot. we got a great parking lot full of people today. We're glad you're here. Uh, But I want to give you an invitation to this coming Wednesday night is our night of worship. It'll be right here in the courtyard. We didn't fire up the heaters. We did it for the first service today. We've got about another eight or 10 more heaters that are going to be filling the whole courtyard. But evening service, 615, we will be online. But if you want to come in your car, if you want to come in the courtyard, we're going to do a Christmas tree lighting. We're going to light up the whole courtyard. It's going to be beautiful. We are going to uh, kick off a series, uh, our, our Christmas series. And I'm going to ask this question at night of worship, 615 this Wednesday. I'm going to ask this question. What if this could be your best Christmas ever? What if it could be the best Christmas ever? Because all the other stuff that takes our attention and time that really isn't about Jesus, it's kind of been pushed to the side. And what if we just focused on what it's really about, the coming of God into human history, the birth of Jesus? So we're going to kick that off Wednesday night, 615, join us. And then starting the next Sunday, we go into a Christmas series called Adore. And we are going to just gather and adore. And if you love great Christmas music, praising God, then join us online. Join us in the courtyard. Join us in the parking lot. If you're going to be with us next Sunday or Wednesday night, please go online and register so we can kind of get everything all set up and and get all situated to have a great time together. So we invite you to come on campus or at home, 615 Wednesday night, next Sunday, 9 o'clock and 11 o'clock. And then also, if you want prayer, Pastor Dennis is right up there. Hey, Pastor Dennis, uh, top of the stairs. We've not been having as many people go for prayer, and we really want to encourage you before you leave, if you're in your car or in the courtyard, just take a moment, go meet Pastor Dennis and his team and spend some time praying. Let us lift you up in prayer. There's power in prayer. Take advantage of that. If you're online, just respond to the information you see on your screen, and we'll respond back to you in prayer. And then if you're new at Shoreline or visiting us, we want to give you a personal welcome. If you're in the courtyard or if you're in a car, go right by the very last tent here with the Giant blue and silver balloons and Patty's smiling face. Hi, Patty. Good to see you. And uh, be sure you go back and say hi to Patty. And she has a gift she wants to give you and answer any questions you have about Shoreline Church. If you're at home, we want to give you just as warm a welcome as we can. And so uh, just respond to the information on your screen right there. And we will send you a digital connection card and come alongside of you and help in any way we can there. So as we close our time, this is the word of blessing I want to give you. May your I believes based on God's word, my every I believe you hold in your heart leads you to an I will so that your life looks more and more like Jesus. So you walk in obedience to his calling. So you hear and heed his warnings, his loving, caring warnings. 
May every I believe lead to an I will, so with every day you become more like Jesus. Amen? God bless you at home. God bless you in your cars. God bless you in the courtyard. In the courtyard, uh, before you leave, put your mask back on and wait until one of our ushers come. They're going to dismiss you right away here and make sure you visit with people when you can and just keep a little distance and let's be the family of God. God bless you. We'll see you Wednesday night.